it's fun watching all the participant numbers increase. I was like, yeah, this is going to be exciting. Welcome, everyone. We're just waiting as people come in. Everyone grabbing our beverages. Yeah, it's not like the old days in the in the microbrewery. I do miss those days, and I'm looking forward to when we can do those, the Petri dish those there again. Fall semester. Fall semester. We'll be back. So on the other hand, an advantage is we bring people in from a broader geographic area, which is wow. really good, so. I mean, this has been great to definitely reach across for people who may not make it, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pandemic silver lining. And I get to still enjoy things even though I'm out here in DC. How are things so, in DC? Things are good, you yeah. know, yeah. We'll have to catch up a little bit on that. Okay, good, good. Uh, well, I think we'll get started here. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Petri Dish tonight, uh, today, this afternoon. We're all in different time zones, it seems. Um, I'm Mohammed uh, Yakub, tonight's moderator for Petri Dish, uh, this event that's brought to you by the College of Biological Sciences uh, at the University of Minnesota in collaboration with the Bell Museum. For those of you who haven't attended a Petri Dish event, so these conversations are usually held in person, um, often in an informal setting where we explore topics related, related to how biology affects our life, uh, our lives for that matter, um, and what it means for our future. So we've had these events at Camp Bar in St. Paul, at Urban Growler, um, and while I miss those, we've moved everything online um, due to the pandemic, but hopefully, as Dean Forbes said, potentially this fall we'll be able to return to a more analog style gathering. So a few quick announcements. Um, if you are eager for more science in your lives, um, which who isn't, uh, there are a few additional opportunities coming up, including a probable meets possible conversation with Dr. Jennifer Powers. Uh, she's fantastic, her work in Costa Rica, and Dr. Heidi Roop, and they'll speak about climate change research. Uh, there's also SciSpark, a program with fast-paced biology-themed lightning talks coming up on April 21st and a freshwater moose lecture on pharmaceutical pollution, which definitely seems uh, relevant uh, on April 22nd. So um, again, here within the next month or so. Uh, you'll get an email with links to RSVP to all these fantastic events. So you have access to them as well. Uh, this afternoon, we have three researchers here for what promises to be a fantastic conversation on equity within the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, but before we get to that, I'll turn it over to CVS Dean Valerie Forbes. All right, thank you, Mo. Welcome everybody to the College of Biological Sciences Petri Dish. As some of you well know, this is one of several ways that we try to share our science with the community. And our science is supported by you and much of the research conducted is geared to make our communities better. So we're very happy that you've decided to enter our virtual Petri dish today and be part of our latest experiment. Uh, I encourage you to be, as usual, to be active participants. Please ask questions and engage with the participants. For these conversations, we bring together people from our college, the university, and beyond who have expertise and a point of view to share around topics of broad interest uh, with a biological bent. Today's topic is one that we as scientists and educators are particularly concerned about, systemic racism and equity in STEM. While it's tempting to see science as somehow immune, the reality is that the history of STEM is inseparable from the large story of racism in this country. Science is not done in a vacuum, but rather is influenced by what's happening in society. But I also think science offers us a way forward Scientists are good at asking questions and gathering evidence. The more research we conduct and the more we learn, the clearer it becomes that we have much work to do to ensure that the scientific community is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. As a college committed to evidence-based thinking, we're called upon to look closely at how we teach, conduct research, and connect with the world around us to ensure that all members of our collegiate community are supported by equitable, equitable policies and practices. 
as we work to bring down the barriers for scientists and community members who are black, indigenous, and people of color, we realize the full potential of our disciplines. It's a hopeful, if fraught, moment in our history. The researchers joining with us this afternoon have valuable insight about how we can expand the circle of who aspires to become a scientist and how we can enable them to succeed in STEM fields. So with that, I hope you'll join in with your own questions and comments. I repeat, please ask questions of our panelists and engage in the dialogue. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as we can. Thank you for being here and enjoy the discussion. Mo, over to you. Thank you, Dean Forbes. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, the college taking the lead on having this dialogue on this timely topic. I know there's a lot of internal conversation happening as well. Uh, so before we get started with the event and I get to, I have the privilege of introducing all the speakers in a little bit, um, I will reiterate what Dean Forbes said, submit questions and engage in the dialogue. Uh, we want to hear from you. So unlike our live event, I think it would be great to integrate audience questions within the conversation rather than just wait until the end. So don't wait either. Uh, so the question then comes, how do you ask questions? So um, submit your questions via the chat function in Zoom and Cla Claire will correct me if I'm misspeaking. Your message will go directly to Claire Wilson. She is working behind the scenes to aggregate all these questions um, and to get the questions through to us. Uh, if you have any technical issues, you can also ask those via the same chat function. Uh, we have turned closed captioning on. If you would want to hide that, you can do so by clicking the live trans transcript button um, at the bottom or wherever on Zoom. Uh, we will be recording the webinar and posting it online. Uh, so we'll share the uh, link to that afterward as well. So for those who can't make it, feel free to share with them as well. Um, and lastly, I encourage you to engage uh, in the broader conversation via social media. So this is not just a topic for today, but rather part of a much larger and complex issue. Uh, so before I introduce the speakers who all share, will share their amazing expertise, um, briefly I'll introduce myself. Uh, so I am an alumnus of the College of Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I got my PhD in plant biology. After that, I worked at the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, or CFINS, also at the U, for a few years. Um, and now I work at SciLine, a program based at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, um, where we connect scientists with reporters to get more science in journalism. Um, so moving on to the topic of today here. Um, as Dean Forbes uh, said, uh, the topic for discussion today is addressing systemic racism in science. So we know that systemic racism is prevalent in our society, um, at least for me, it's, I often think of it as discussed in terms of laws and policies, what has been done and what we need to do. But systemic racism has a lot of other effects, including furthering biases, which then continue the racism and the cycle continues. Um, and funny enough, within the fields of science, science um, we scientists, and I acknowledge I am not excused from this, we tend to say that we're focusing on only the science or the data, right? Uh, so we're not really entrenched in racism, but our experiences really influence how we behave and what we value. Uh, and the fields of STEM are not excluded by any means. Um, in fact, by denying that, right, like we are including that particular bias. So let's have this discussion on equity in STEM. Uh, specifically, how can we identify and dismantle racism and bias in STEM education and STEM professions what does research tell us about how these persisting societal biases manifest in STEM fields? And then how can we better support um, everyone, which results in a more uh, equity, equitable scientific research and perspectives represented to solve the grand challenges? So with that, I get to introduce the speakers. We'll start with uh, Dr. Hilary Barron. Dr. Barron is a postdoc, po postdoctoral researcher, I can never say that word. Um, in biology teaching and learning here at the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences. Uh, and her work focuses on disrupting systemic structures of inequity and racism in science and science learning through culturally responsive science teaching. That itself is a lot, so I'm very <laughs> glad to hear that. She leads professional development for biology teaching assistants, um, so all the TAs that uh, we talk about and hear about, uh, and faculty, as well as for K-12 science educators. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Hillary. 
Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm really excited to be here. And I just want to thank everyone again for inviting me to participate with these amazing other panelists. Um, I'm Hillary. I am a postdoc researcher uh, working with Sohoya Kotner in biology teaching and learning in the College of Biological Sciences. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief background of, of kind of where I came from and how I came to be in the work that I'm doing right now. Um, I am a descendant of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe, which is a Native American tribal community in northern Minnesota. So I am Anishinaabe. Um, I'm a first generation college student, so the first person in my family to go to school, the first and only person on either sides of my family to get a doctoral degree. Um, and I, you know, really carry that with me in, in the work that I do and, and really feel like I, it's my job to live up to the importance of, of what that work um, means not only to my community, but to my family as well. So I grew up in Northern Minnesota in a really small rural area. Um, I got my master's degree in environmental science from Bemidji State University, which is a regional university here in Northern Minnesota. And then after I finished my master's degree, I started teaching biology and environmental science courses and ecology courses at Leech Lake Tribal College, which is a predominantly native serving two-year institution or tribal college in Northern Minnesota. And as all of us might know, or maybe you don't know, um, when you go into teaching at a two-year school or even a four-year school or even in a research university, you don't need uh, any background in education or, or teaching or pedagogy um, unless you're going to teach in a, a teaching uh, um, department. And so I was kind of thrown into the deep end of what does it mean to teach science? And um, I will tell you, the first lesson I learned really quick was <laughs> excitement for your content area is not enough. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that was really prevalent early on in my teaching experiences and, and consistent throughout the entire time that I was at Leech Lake Tribal College was um, most of my Native students coming into my courses, which were required courses, um, had either a fear of science or a perception of science that they couldn't do it. And that was based on a narrative that they had been basically exposed to or force fed in their K-12 experiences leading up to undergraduate science. And so that's when I first started thinking about, you know, what is our responsibility as undergraduate educators and how can we change the way that we teach science to start to disrupt those kinds of systemic issues that Indigenous students face. And of course, having not a lot of background in education, realized, you know, that I needed to prepare myself more in that arena. Um, and that's actually why I left the tribal college to go get my PhD in science education to better equip myself with the ideas of pedagogy and research and really thinking, you know, on a bigger scale of, of what can I do to help make those changes happen. Um, and so since finishing my PhD, I've been working as a postdoc, um, developing ideas around what does it mean to be culturally responsive in undergraduate biology education. And how can we use culturally responsive science teaching to break down these systemic uh, structures of racism? So that's kind of where I came from, where I came to be, and why I came to be in this space. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to hear more from the other panelists and talk more about these ideas. Awesome. Um, I can't wait to hear more about this culturally responsive because I already have questions about what that means, and we'll come back to that. Um, so next, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Angela Google. Dr. Google is also a postdoc associate um, uh, in discipline-based educational research at the University of South Alabama. Um, her dissertation work explored how cultural and societal factors impacted the economic, academic success of women in color in the context of undergraduate biology. Her current research examines how students mutually constructed identities, so race and ethnicity, gender, class, STEM, uh, impact their perceptions of their learning environment and illuminate aspects of their learning experience that are useful to the promotion of effective teaching and learning of culturally diverse students. So I'll turn it over to you, Angela. Thank you. I also am thankful to be here and amongst other the other panelists and um, just a little bit about my background. I feel like I took a non-traditional pathway um, here. My undergraduate and graduate degrees are in secondary education. So I was grooming myself to be a high school biology teacher, um, had a love for science, love for biology. And once I got out of undergraduate, um, I graduated mid-year, couldn't find a teaching job and I fell into housing. So housing, I was a housing director for four and a half years. Um, and after that, I was an academic advisor for four and a half years. So 
I was outside of the classroom seeing students um, struggle with their academics from a different perspective. And so I got to know students and know their barriers to just being successful in college from multiple perspectives. Uh, as an academic advisor, something that kept coming up for especially my science students, my STEM students, was that they did not know how to study. They did not know how to prepare for their undergraduate introductory classes. They were struggling. And often they would you know, leave the science just because they didn't get a grasp on how to do that. So that led me to want to understand how can I help students um, understand study skills, understand just how to navigate these introductory courses um, in, a, in a more effective way. So getting my PhD, I naturally wanted to continue in sciences as well as the educational component of it. So I um, graduate, I will graduate uh, from Middle Tennessee State University in May. Um, so I'm at this kind of transition phase, but in this program, it allowed me to examine students um, from multiple kind of marginalized identities and how that affected those barriers to being successful students have barriers such as, you know, learning how to study and navigate introductory classes, but sometimes those can, those struggles can be amplified when you're also dealing with um, different, you know, different things that traditionally marginalized students have to deal with. And so my, my work structured to a format of identity-based research. And so looking at how students development of their science identity, as well as, um, just navigating these introductory classes, how that plays a role in their academic success. Um, and so I, I feel like, uh, like I said, I've taken a non-traditional pathway, but I, I feel like my perspective allows me to see barriers from, from both perspectives inside and outside of the classroom. So happy to be here. Fantastic. Um, I love that you brought up this multiple marginalized communities. I think that's the thing that, I've, is usually thought of in individual boxes. So I'll be interested to hear more about that when we get um, to that conversation. Um, and our final um, panelist speaker tonight is um, Dr. Stephanie Marshall. Dr. Marshall is an assistant professor of STEM education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in the College of Education and Human De Development uh, at the University of Minnesota in Twin Cities. Uh, her research takes up questions that consider how policies and decisions about science education impact the science experiences of marginalized youth. Dr. Marshall is also the lead instructor for a course that engages aspiring secondary teachers on the knowledge and skills needed to address both the social and cultural dimensions of education. So I'll turn it over to you, Stephanie. Hello all, and I also appreciate the invitation and, and so much saw so much of my narrative in uh, what Hillary and Angela have already uh, shared uh, and, and I find that so many of us, uh, especially folks of color who who become researchers have these like non-traditional experiences because we don't have people above like before us, like our parent, my, my parents weren't researchers. Um, and so really going down this path to figure out where I fit. Um, and so I am originally from uh, Metro Detroit um, and, and doing science, I, I don't take it for granted that as a child, I saw that I was a doer of science. It wasn't until I was in college and I'm graduating because I just assumed that other science people had to be other places, right? Like I was in classes and I typically was the only one, but they have to be somewhere else. And it wasn't until I was graduating and in line with the other biology students and realized they weren't other places. And it struck me because that moment was such a critical moment because I just, I had so many assumptions because I had the experience of having black and brown teachers that looked like me. Uh, I had classes of uh, honors and AP courses with folks that looked like me, but also I should say, I had the experience of going to majority black and brown schools, but I also attended majority white schools and the experiences were very different. And so by the time my science identity had already really been developed, I already saw myself as a doer of science and I got those messages. I didn't. I also didn't assume to just get those messages from school. I got them at home. So my mom was a teacher and she worked in Detroit, Detroit public schools. And there were 
so many signals from my parents. Of, like I was a young astronaut as a kid. Like my mom would take me to these different meetings. Uh, I have a twin sister and we would we were involved in all the after school activities. Uh, so to even just have transportation to do those type of things or, or that, that type of support. Um, Christmas gifts, like there's this little microscope that I remember receiving that you really couldn't see anything out of. But it's symbolic of my, me being a curious kid and my parents nourishing that curiosity. And so really, and, and I, I say I fell into teaching because I, I, I went down this non-traditional track. Uh, I started, I had a degree in biology. I thought I would do what smart kids do. I think as a student of color, you don't get a lot of coaching on all the options that are available. And I, I started med school and realized this wasn't for me. Um, I started teaching middle school and high school. And immediately I was hearing my students and, and I know I just, I heard Hillary say this. We hear it so much that kids say, I don't do science. And I'm like, why? Like science is just answering the questions about the world around you. Like to me, it didn't make sense um, because this wasn't what I, this isn't what I knew. This wasn't my lived reality. And so really in thinking about culturally relevant pedagogies, I think about I'm, I'm designing for the kids that are in front of me. And so what that means is it's, it's more than the content, it's, it's also me having a lens for my students that I see them, I see their experiences and their narratives and who they are and their communities that they come from, but also that I'm preparing them for the world they're gonna go into. So it's, it's having explicit conversations of science and STEM has not done right by folks of color. Like we need to be explicit and have those conversations. What is that science is a white norm space? What does it mean to be a person of color in those spaces? So it means to be, we need to be explicit and have, ex, we need to be deliberate and have explicit conversations. And I also am thinking about the, 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 the youth that I work for and behalf on, because I tell my students uh, I, in my introduction, it was mentioned that I, I am the lead instructor for the race and culture class for our secondary aspiring teachers. And in that class, I tell my students, I, you are in my classroom, but I teach for the students you will teach and you will be in front of. So it's not about them. And so, and that's sometimes that, that could rub somebody the wrong way, but I know that my practice is not for the majority white population that's in front of me because I know where they're going to be. And that's what keeps me going because I get pushed back because nobody trains you to do that type of work because people are not always, I tell them on the first day, you like me today. But in a few weeks, you might not like me and that's okay. And I take that and I accept that and I receive that because, because when you get angry with me, we're gonna work through that. And then you're gonna see why I have to push you in uncomfortable ways. So that is, yeah. So, I mean, that's what, that's what continues. Um, that's why I think about organizational questions because we have to have structures in place to support kids in the science classrooms. If the teachers don't have the supports, if principals don't have the supports, Superintendents, if they don't have the supports to make the decisions that are going to serve our youth, then we can't expect science to happen in classrooms. And it blows folks' minds when I say we can't assume that elementary kids are getting science. It blows their mind because we often make assumptions that they're getting it and they're not. Research says they're not. So I will end there. Wow. Um, thank you. I was like, you're already blowing my mind. I was like, here I am. Like, you're just telling me that they're not getting this. So, um, well, I, I will follow up on some of that. Uh, but I'll start off, um, and all of you, I think either two of you for sure mentioned this term, but I know we've had this conversation, the word science identity. So what do you mean by that when you say that? Like, can you explain a little bit more? Um, and I'll start with you, Stephanie. So I was actually thinking, uh, Angela, it sounds like your research is specific to that. Like, I'd love to hear your, your definition and because I, I know I know my work is, but I think I would love to hear your, your yeah. definition. Yeah, that's fine. So when I think about science identity, I think about um, kind of a lens to see who is both promoted and marginalized by science teaching and learning. So you're kind of seeing like how students 
feel like they view themselves and they're viewed by others by people within the scientific community. And so this literature just kind of exposes that, exposes the promotion and marginalization of, um, of scientific knowledge, um, like who is accepted in the community, who is not accepted in the community. And an individual will hold that identity. An individual will say, you know, I am or I'm not, but it's based off of their interaction within all of these systems, right? These academic systems and disciplinary systems and these social systems. It's based off of how they're, um, how they're responding and what type of experiences they've had within those systems to develop their kind of um, relationship with science. And so it's, it's individual, but it's influenced by a broader community. And so I can build on that because I, I think the work that I do is to support teachers in, in supporting kids and developing that identity. Mm -hmm. So first we have to, like for me and my work is supporting folks in I say shifting their lens because we can only uh, we can only design lessons and see our students through the lens that we currently have. Yeah. And so until I expose them to like uh, this complex and racist history that like help them to see systemic racism, I can't. Sh I need to shift their lens a bit. And so if I can shift their lens, they will design for kids, and they then they can can work with students in a way where kids start to see themselves as being doers of science. And, and so that, I, yeah. You no, know, I was going to say, adding to that, that goes in line with other literature that supports you can't look at science identity in isolation. You have to look at it with other multiple identities. Like you have to consider their cultural identity. You have to consider, you know, you know, their backgrounds and where they're coming from, their gender, their race and everything to see how that impacts um, how they're viewing themselves as scientists. It can't just be, okay, do you think you're a scientist or not? Do you think you're a science person or not? It has to be, how are all these factors playing a role? How are all your other multiple identities playing a role in shaping and developing your science identity and considering that when we do that type of research, don't just, you know, not just isolating it. Yeah, I wanted to just to, to build on something Stephanie had said also, which is she tells her students that she's gonna push them in uncomfortable ways. And one of the conversations I think that's important to have is it's uncomfortable for, for white people in those spaces because they are not either um, aware of or do not accept that um, you know, this is a system that orbits around whiteness and that identities in science are you know, basically kind of funneled into this one kind of um, white narrative of what a scientist should be or what a scientist could look like. Um, and so that's one of the things I also try to have conversations with educators about is, of course, we're going to think about uh, promoting positive identities in science, but what are, what is your idea of an identity in science and what is that informed by and, you know, you know, how narrow is that um, perception and can you broaden it? Yeah, that made me think of literature based on science identity as as a becoming, mm -hmm. like an idea of becoming a scientist. It's about the process, not necessarily a destination. Like there's no one way to be a scientist. There's no mm -hmm. one science identity. It's a process of becoming, um, developing or your science identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've got that. When do you, for each of you, the three of you, when did you think you developed your science identity? Essentially. I'm trying to understand like when does it develop uh, if we're teaching elementary kids or middle school, high school, where and whatever trajectory. So for each of you, when did that develop um, and what played roles into that? So I, I, I'm kind of struggling to answer because I, I feel like I feel like I'm always trying to attain a science identity. Um, and I think that part of that is because I feel like I've been kind of programmed through various um, experiences to you know, live with this imposter syndrome that, you know, women and indigenous women face in science. Um, but I would say that I, you know, I had some positive science, um, early emerging science research experiences with science fair in high school. And that might be the earliest point in time when I can think back to, you know, having a person, and for me, it was a, a high school biology teacher, having a person that expressed confidence in your ability to think about science and explore the world really, was really critical for me and my, you know, just starting to think and, and explore what it meant to um, be a person that wanted to go into a science discipline. So I, I guess I would say that's the earliest for me that it kind of started to 
um, formulate, but I would also say I'm still working on it. <laughs> I was like, I hear you about that imposter syndrome. That's yeah, yeah prevalent. Yeah, I would also, um, I feel like my science identity took on different um, dimensions or took different levels uh, along my journey. I feel like in high school and early undergraduate years, I was often the only black girl in science, like only black girl taking biology classes, only black girl, you know, trying to take advance or major in biology, the only one. And so at those stages, you don't identify yourself within that community because it's like nobody else around you looks like that. You just know I love science and I want to do this, right? And it wasn't until I got older and realized that I could have a profession in science or I could have I could be a scientist in multiple ways that I feel like I knew to kind of put that language with what I was experiencing of science identity. It wasn't until probably probably my, my master's degree that I realized, oh, I can do science in, in multiple ways. It's not just a somebody with a lab coat, you know, mm -hmm. mixing chemicals in the, you know, the lab, like science looks very different. And so when I began to make science my own, I feel like I developed my science identity. Uh, that, that lab coat image always, why? <laughs> <laughs> so, and like I said earlier, I, I struggle with not or thinking about when I didn't know I could do science because it was just something we did, even just thinking about the science things, activities we did at home. And like I said, my, my mom was a teacher. And so I remember doing stuff in the summer. Like, I remember just like engaging in, in so many different ways. Like if it was like preparing for a science fair and doing something with my mom. Like I saw her excitement too. Like, I think that's something too. So I never saw this disconnect of like, it wasn't a part of me cause it was just what we did. Um, and so I, I know I'm fortunate in that way. Um, but I do want to say that like research tells us that kids make decisions about their future careers by middle school. And so, like I said, if kids aren't doing it elementary school they've already made decisions by middle school and they haven't been exposed. Um, and I've done some work with middle school teachers and they're saying that uh, like as time progresses, they have to start with um, more, the like lower and lower skills. So even thinking about using a ruler, like they really think things that we see as basic that like kids, a lot of times we're doing in elementary school, they're not doing anymore. And so, uh, so when we think about the skills that students have now, um, it, it's a struggle because especially at the elementary level. So my PhD is actually in educational policy. And one reason I studied policy uh, is because there, there are the, like if we think about No Child Left Behind, like past policies that still inform our practices today. And so if um, schools are, um, I was just looking at transcripts today from a principal. And one of the things they said was like, well, I wanna focus on science, but I want my kids to be successful. Mm -hmm. But success is determined by assessments. If you only test once in elementary school and that's fourth or fifth grade in most states, then that's your signal of success. But then kids only get science when they're about to take a test. So everything is based on these, these there, are all, there are all these unintended consequences of these larger policies that folks hadn't thought about. And so we see that play out in our schools. And now I think we're in a phase of post no child is behind but we still have no child left behind behaviors because not much has really changed. And so we really have to think about these accountability pressures. Do teachers have the ability to, to do science without it being, without their jobs being on the line? That's, I'm just still baffled that you said they make career decisions by middle school. Like that's, wow. Um, yeah. So when we think about also the, if we have children, when we think about our different contexts and the types of resources our elementary schools have, uh, if we think about urban context, rural context, there are all of these other, they may not have the resources. And so, but even with the resources, what I found in my research was that uh, at first the principals in this one district, was, they were saying that it's because we don't have resources, but when they had resources, they were putting out all these other fires. And so we never got to science because in most 
elementary principals have not had any type of science or PD since they were in college. So they need support, desperately need support. And it's not about them not wanting support. Sometimes it's not offered or the resources are allocated in ways that go to reading and math and not science. So we really need to think about inter, uh, content areas being interdisciplinary because we can't disentangle science from math. We shouldn't be dis, uh, disentangling it from reading. I mean, even social studies and history, like there's so much that, that could be interdisciplinary, but we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't really trained our teachers, or if we have, we've trained them and then they go off into schools and those teachers haven't been trained to do that work. Well, that's okay. A lot to think about. Um, so I'll turn back, I think Hillary, you had mentioned the term culturally responsive. So I wanted you to at least talk about that. And then we have a question from one of our audience members, um, Elena James. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. So does it change with every cohort? Does cultural responsive pedagogy change with every cohort? If you could speak a little bit about that. Uh, Hillary, we'll start with you and then we'll come back to Stephanie. I know you have a little bit on that too. Sure. So I think that there are, um, you know, there's different ways to approach culturally responsive. Well, so culturally relevant pedagogy is, is a terminology and I use a framework called culturally responsive science teaching, which I've been developing, building on some of these other existing frameworks because we don't have, um, we don't have a, a, a framework of culturally relevant pedagogy specific to undergraduate science. Um, so we take from, you know, the giants like Gloria Ladson Billings who came up with culturally culturally relevant pedagogy and Geneva Gay who talks about culturally responsive science teaching or culturally responsive teaching. Um, and you know, we continue to build on those, those works and, and build frameworks that um, are more specific to you know, our individual spaces. Um, so for me, how I kind of envision and interpret culturally responsive teaching is kind of thinking about three bigger areas within the idea of what does it mean to be culturally responsive. Um, so my framework looks at things like in a, in a general sense, from a cultural responsive sense, you know, are we, what are we doing to think about, are there multiple ways for students to demonstrate competency and intelligence? Are there multiple ways for students to achieve success? And are we interrogating, you know, the kinds of success that we're talking about? Are we interrogating, you know, what does um, achievement actually look like? And are we going based on some of these outdated policies like Stephanie was talking about? Um, and then I also work in the space of something called funds of knowledge <clears throat> and funds of knowledge connections or funds of knowledge really refers to, you know, we, we come to the table with these um, skill sets and the knowledges that we have been cultivating and developing over time that are unique to us in our home communities and our home discourses. Um, you know, we develop these basically ways of knowing and these funds of how we approach um, various aspects of life. And so funds of knowledge connections in teaching asks, you know, are we looking to validate and how can we validate and have students draw upon theirs, those knowledges and those perspectives? And how are we thinking about developing positive science identities by making sure students can incorporate their knowledge and their backgrounds into science learning? Um, and then I also work within a space of sociopolitical consciousness connections, which thinks about, you know, are what kinds of local, regional, community-based problems can we incorporate into teaching and learning, into content, into processes, so that students are positioned in, um, you know, as decision makers and and in you know uh, positions of agency to actually be empowered through activities that are, you know, relevant to things that are happening today. Um, so I'm, I'm using culturally responsive science teaching in kind of that approach. I've been working and developing this framework based on what works in undergraduate science, undergraduate biology teaching and learning. Um, and I would be super interested to hear how Stephanie and Angela interpret and work with culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally responsive teaching um, to the point of does culturally responsive teaching or pedagogy change with, you know, from cohort to cohort. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that question might be more directed towards Stephanie and her work with um, pre-service teachers perhaps, or, or secondary teachers. Um, so I might leave that for her to answer <laughs> because I think that, you know, for me as a person who takes up the work, I, you know, I don't think that there's a static version of culturally responsive teaching. And so I think that, you know, in some aspects, it's always going to be changing because I think that's the point of it, right? We're trying to interrogate how can we dismantle systems and how can we use culturally responsive teaching to do that? So in a sense, it's always going to be um, changing from cohort to cohort, but I'm not sure if that question is more specific to what Stephanie was talking about a little bit ago. 
I I agree 100% Hillary that it, it changes and like in my introduction I mentioned like um I I teach based on who's or culturally relevant pedagogy is for me teaching whoever is in front of me so a part of getting to know who's in front well that's the main thing I have to first get to know who's in front of me mm-hmm. so it's about developing relationships um which is I mean and we think about in our our virtual world right now like with classes being on zoom like having to find other ways to connect with students um, so, so I also think about, so with the, the secondary teachers, I think there are, um, or the aspiring secondary teachers, um, pre-service teachers, um, I think with that, um, how I have helped to redesign the class, there, I have to support them in seeing their gaps so that they are critically reflective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's a key component to, to teacher practice is being critically reflective. But so often, if I'm I'm getting I'm getting them after they've finished their undergraduate degree, and they they feel so comfortable in that content knowledge, and they just assume like I'll be good with kids, I'll be good, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. But then to disrupt that a bit, we start with the history. So I talk we talk about the history of education mm-hmm. um, because there's so much there how schools have been used to harm children. Um, really weapons Mm -hmm. and so so really problematizing even schooling which is seen as as this like public good and so once we problematize that and and I've had students cry like after like by week two three because uh and and typically it's like I see the student like really overwhelmed like and they'll just be sitting like it's happened a couple times where a student is sitting by themselves they're super overwhelmed and we haven't even talked about a reading yet. They've just read at home. And by the time we get to class, they are overwhelmed. And I go over and I'm like, so tell me what's going on. And just tears start falling because they're like, why didn't anyone tell me this? And they feel so hurt that no one has told them. And so part of that is like, so now you see the gap and now let's like build you up. Now let's support you and like fill in those gaps of why didn't anyone tell you? Like what, so we say that, uh, so schooling is a public good, but how has it been used? How has it harmed kids? Um, when we talk about philosophies of education, um, we're gonna talk about pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, uh, we'll talk about schooling as a, a democratic practice. And so we go through these different philosophies around education because there are specific objectives and purposes around education um, and we so so that they can then develop their own philosophies that are grounded in uh, anti-racist practices that uh, will shift the paradigm of education so so it's it's planning for the folks who are in front of me and I will I guess my last point is that even teaching it's a summer course it's an accelerated course and even the idea of that is we need to this class needs to be taught before they are with kids so it's a five-week accelerated course and 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 even in the last summer um, there was a difference in the students that I was trying to figure out what is going on and so when students showed up last summer uh, this is post George Floyd's murder this is uh, many students protested and um, and they were coming to class thinking like we protested and we're done. And it was just this, um, don't you think things have changed Dr. Marshall? And I'm like, no. It was mind blowing to me because as a woman of color <laughs> that they thought it was done and it's just begun or their work in this, their awareness in this has just started. Um, and so it was kind of working through that. So there was like this resistance uh, and that I had to work through with them, which was different and it was exhausting work. And compared to previous years where I taught two sections of the same class, I taught one and I had to take a nap like every day because it's exhausting because you're working with, you're working with folks who don't, may not have an awareness and trying to coach them through. Mm-hmm. And no one, like I keep saying, no one teaches you how to do that. Like I'm thankful, I'm grateful that I found a way to do it in a way that it's received because that's part of it too. 
if the students are not able to receive what I'm saying, they will get, there are versions of this class where folks stormed out. Folks storm out of class because they get upset. And, and that's a reality. Um, people are uncomfortable. They are a, a indication of resistance is you shut down, you, you leave, you, and that's happened. I haven't really had that. Um, I've had students angry with me, but I haven't had the storming. Um, so yes, I definitely designed for the students in front of me. Um, and depending on the class, uh, there's always like my lens doesn't change, but the content, the delivery is going to be uh, dependent on who I'm working with um, so that they get what they need from that class. Mm -hmm. Wow, you have quite the plethora of responses from your students. Um, crying to everything. Um, so we have another question from the, uh, someone in the audience. And this, all three of you have uh, teach in some, on some level. You have students of, uh, at various levels. So as educators, what is the most commonly or widely reported thing that educators do that makes students feel marginalized? Or that educators might not do that makes the students feel marginalized? So if you can pinpoint a couple, yeah. Um, something that comes up very often is representation, um, how we represent scholars in the field, how we represent scientists, how we represent um, those that have come before us and those that are currently doing the work inside the classroom. Like if your representation is, you know, just one type of person can, you know, do, do science, then that's what you're students who aren't, that don't fall in line with that type of person feel marginalized. If they feel like, you know, am I, is somebody, does somebody like me, can they do science? You know, somebody that looks like me or, you know, have similar characteristics or hold similar identities, can they do that? And so um, wanting to know, you know, how to diversify that, that representation within your classroom. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, right, that's key, my right, representation. I was just gonna say anyone else, either Stephanie or Hillary. So I guess what I would add is that, um, uh, so often, I guess what I find working with uh, pre-service teachers and, and and I shouldn't group them, them all, I would say the majority of our secondary aspiring teachers are white. Um, we have a handful of teachers of color and like, and I try to like, uh, interact with them individually, and we do have programs uh, that that target uh, support programs of support for our, our teachers scholars of color because their needs are different. Um, but I will say for our, our white uh, educators, um, they don't know what they don't know, mm -hmm. and so they may not they don't recognize that they are not seeing the potential of their students or how they have been socialized to not believe that students of color can do science. So, so it, it, it sends a signal of, like, if you tell um, one student, you know, you're really, you should really uh, look at the AP course, like, or the AP biology course. Did you tell that to the white student and the black student? Like, who who's gets the signals that they are doers of science? Uh, I remember when I was in school, and I, I use storytelling as a part of um, a critical race theory um, counter narratives um, that that really um, counter the, the the status quo. So I use personal narratives. And so one example of an experience that I had that told me I didn't fit was I had a teacher, I was in the eighth grade, I can remember where I was. And this teacher was sitting at her desk and she said, Stephanie, where are you from? And I said, and I told her it was a city of Metro Detroit. Well, no, where are you really from? And I said, Detroit? <laughs> I mean, I hadn't lived there since I was six, but if that's what you want. So I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what she's asking me. Then she said, where are your parents from? I said, Alabama. And it took me years to figure out what she was trying to get at and then I don't know when it was, but it clicked with me as an adult. She didn't think an African-American could be intelligent. I could not be African-American. 
she continued to ask me this question until, but I couldn't give her the answer that she thought. Mm -hmm. So she was denying my narrative in that moment. So even through this, like, really, it sounds like a very simple question. It's so complex. I know that there's so much more in that question because you're telling me I don't fit here. Mm -hmm. So our kids are traumatized through experiences all the time mm -hmm. when they could be, they're well-intended, but we know that well-intended folks hurt people. Mm -hmm. And then the, the continuation of that process is coming to an undergraduate science class with the narrative that they can't do it or that their knowledge isn't valid or that they don't have any knowledge or that you know whatever they come to the table with is already not sufficient. So I would say another thing from, from that side of it, and I'm sure that this is in K-12 spaces you know, also really important. I mean, I know that it is, but I don't have specific examples from my experiences, but I can share an example of something that, so I, I work with teaching assistants on you know, thinking about what does it mean to be culturally responsive in your labs and um, I had a teaching assistant who was leading a lab on bacterial growth and measuring the zone of inhibition and things like that. And over the course of the semester, students were, um, you know, doing all of this research in the lab. And um, the, the impetus for that research was that the TA, you know, they were allowed to bring an item from home or a substance from home or something like that to use as the, um, to test against the control variable, you know, to measure bacterial growth and whatnot. And so one of the TAs that I was working with started that whole unit, started that whole part of the semester by asking students, what did they know, you know, before even talking about any of the actual microbiome stuff, what do you know about how to preserve food? What do you know about food spoiling? You know, those kinds of things, which launched an entire conversation from students talking about things like, well, I know that my mom puts, you know, apples in uh, lemon juice if we're going to keep them in the fridge for longer than a day or something like that. And just the snowball of conversations of students shooting back and forth things like, well, my aunt does two tablespoons of apple cider, apple cider vinegar every day and never has stomach problems. So anyway, so this is a whole conversation that, you know, maybe spanned a half an hour. Students just, you know, having this really great conversation of what they already knew about food and bacteria and those kinds of things. And he used that and carried that through the arc of the whole semester, bringing students back to this idea that you know you're already coming to the table with knowledge of microbiology and let's build on that and use that and relate what we're learning to your own experiences and by the end of the semester students who and so i i observed i was observing him for research for the research that i'm doing and so i was watching all these conversations unfold and by the end of the semester students who were either really reserved or intimidated at the beginning were very vocal, very, you know, at least outwardly appearing really confident. And because, you know, it was a, a moment in the beginning of the semester where he took a half hour to validate their prior knowledge and that carried through the whole semester. And so, you know, I mean, that is something that it doesn't take a lot of mental energy on the part of the educator, it doesn't take a lot of time and it can tie into, you know, anything that you do for the course of, you know, all of the time that you have with students. And I feel like it built, you know, it built a really strong foundation for a trusting relationship too between the TA and the students. So that's an example, I think, a powerful example of how students are coming to the table with, you know, feeling insufficient, but obviously they're not. Obviously we have all of this really important background information that if we just are told we can use it, <laughs> can unlock, I think, a lot of really great learning and conversations. I love that story. That's great. Like I was like, my favorite story. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Um, wow, that's that's powerful. Um, I didn't mention that was a question from Lauren Clan. So thank you, Lauren, when you're listening. So flipping that question on the other end. So if someone else has asked this. So a question from Gina Quirum. As a potential employer on this end, how can potential employers demonstrate to students that their science identity is valued and welcomed in the organization? So what can potential employers do? Well, you one, I think- like, Unmuted, so I'm ready for these answers. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I, I was listening to this um, presentation um, by Dr. Kimberly Griffin and she was talking about how um, to increase the, in, to, promote this inclusive environment, you have to value the type of, like a diverse variety of types of research. Like a lot of people of color or a lot of people um, 
from minority backgrounds have a very community-based um, driven research programs and they're wanting to kind of give back to their environment, give back to their communities that they either grew up in or, or broader. And so understanding like what type of science is deemed valuable, what type of science is deemed as, okay, we can publish this work, we can do this, this um, type of research and this can, you know, go on the front page, but valuing a diverse array of research and saying that, you know, from the employer perspective, we want, we can have this diversity in, in our in our programs, we can fund this, we can, you know, get grants from this and, and do things that may not be seen, you know, may not have traditionally be seen this as valuable. Um, and also looking at it, looking at the kind of system from the institutional perspective instead of the person perspective of how to train them on how to navigate this, the, your system, maybe seeing it how the system itself, like what policies or procedures or things that may be in place that may not feel welcoming to them. Like, are there things that you um, have, have established that are your norm that may kind of at first glance, not make somebody feel welcome or included in that in that setting. Um, and so analyzing it from kind of the institutional perspective of how we can make uh, people feel more welcome versus they need to fit us, like they need to fit our box. They need to, you know, learn how to navigate our, our system, learn how to navigate our policies and so forth. Um. Yeah, I guess I'll build on that because I, I was thinking, I mean, you hit the nail on the head and, and just valuing their work and communicating that um, and providing space for the valuing of work, but who else can they work with? Because like Angela said, we, as coming from communal communities, uh, we want to work in community with other folks. And so, I mean, I would not be at Minnesota if I didn't see that there was potential for which working with others um, and working across departments, just being, being a part of, of a community. Um, that's also, uh, but it was also important to have, being able to have conversations with other marginalized folks. And so being able to, to have those lunches or dinners with, it, that are just kind of off the record to find out like, what does it really mean to be a person of color in this space? Uh, so I did my PhD at Michigan State. And uh, when I visited, I had one visit. And then when, when trying to make a decision, I received the email, like, have you made a decision? I said, well, I need to know what it means to be a black person at Michigan State now. I was very explicit because I knew what I needed. I knew the type of support I needed. And the next visit was very different. So I had meetings with uh, folks of color, the Black Graduate Student Association, um, different faculty from different program areas. So I was very explicit about my needs because I know that, but I also would say that many, um, this is because I had past graduate level experience and I knew I could say that. But how many students know they need to say that? So I think the planning for, for students that may not be able to ask that or employees that may not know that they can ask for that, offering that. And that sends a signal that we don't have anything to hide. It's not our images on our website are just not the images on the website. <laughs> that our mission commitment statements are not just our commitment and mission statements, that they're actions. Mm -hmm. And so how can we communicate across the superficial words that it's a space for you. Yeah, and I would just add to that one thing, which I think, you know, maybe those of us on the panel probably feel like we work with this and, and, and interact with this all the time, but I don't know that this is outwardly obvious to everybody. Um, we need, there needs to be accountability. So, you know, these, as we're looking to put these kinds of things in place where we are not only, you know, not only, you know, thinking about um, you fit us, but <laughs> making a space where people actually can belong, that's awesome. And that's important as the first step, but then how are you gonna make sure that that continues? And as, you know, both Stephanie and Angela are saying, how, how do you make sure that it's not just lip service? And when there are issues and when it does get uncomfortable, how do you actually, how do you actually get through that in ways that are meaningful and lasting? Oh, I, I like those. I was like really 
showing the value, creating community, right? And then creating space for retention. I really like that, uh, the community piece um, spreading throughout. Uh, so we have a bunch more questions um, on STEM education, but I wanna take a moment and actually bring us back to this past year and where we've been, right? So this past year has been a shit show, as we all know, or I should say interesting. Uh, so with the pandemic having changed everything, um, the murders of uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, amongst many others, resulting in police brutality protests across the country and world. So how do these combined issues, I'll just say broadly 2020 as a year, right? Um, affect both your work and then your perspective on this work, right? Because clearly this is, the work you're doing is not in isolation. Um, so actually Hillary, let's start with you and just continue that, yeah. So, I, you know, I think one of the things that is the most challenging conversation to me to for me to have when I work with educators is and I think at some point we talked on this someone said something about this at the beginning I think um, you know this idea of um, you know just wanting to do science and science is objective and, and all of these things and so I feel like the biggest conversation that or the biggest obstacle to having conversations about culturally responsive teaching for me with science faculty and um, teaching assistants and teachers is combating the idea that science is not cultural. And so combating the idea that science is, you know, objective. And, and I know that a lot of people are going to get up in arms about it <laughs> because a lot of people are going to say, well, you have to be objective to do good science, but we're humans. We're not robots. You cannot be objective hundred percent of the time. You can't remove yourself hundred percent of the time from the situations. And from my standpoint, you shouldn't. Why would you, <laughs> right? And so for me, that is always the obstacle is having the conversation of, you know, science has a culture, it's based around white culture. And, you know, how can we expand the idea of science culture to include all of the ways of knowing that are really important and valid and valuable. Um, and so that's always a thing that I come up against when I work with people. This last year, it's been really um, an interesting, frustrating um, kind of mix of a bunch of people jumping right into, you know, I wanna do something, what can I do? And then as Stephanie was saying, then like going through a couple you know, conversations and being like, all right, I'm done, I did the thing. I protested or, you know, I wrote a post about, you know, multiculturalism and science and, and that's it. And so it's been, you know, kind of that frustration of, of trying to work through that with people, but then also, you know, coming up against a group of people um, I'm not thinking of one person in particular, but just, you know, a, a kind of a continual group of people who fall back into the, um, that is too political. George Floyd is too political for science. You know, we need to get back to the science of it. I even had a conversation with a few people this fall who wanted to dismiss the impacts of George Floyd and um, all of the, you know, issues with indigenous people and pipelines, because that was a conversation we were having as well. Um, wanted to dismiss those things because the science of COVID was more important. And so for me, just having to feel like we need to fight to have a space where all of these, we can hold all of these things together. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. These things are all important. But at the end of the day, we still have a systemic structure where, you know, indigenous students, black students, students of color, you know, first generation college students are marginalized and pushed out of science. And we still have to try to address that regardless of if you feel like it's valuable or if you're too tired to do it. Um, and so I guess what, you know, to, I guess to say that, you know, it's been frustrating, I think is probably a common perception, but I'm, I also struggle with leaving it at that because I, I, I think we're programmed to try to put a positive spin on things. <laughs> and so I'm trying to both like not go down the path of everything is, you know, dreary, but also be realistic because this is where we are. I appreciate that. Um, Angela, you were finishing grad school. Yes. <laughs> um, so how was that experience your year? I, I can, grad school is a beast on its own, so I can only imagine. Yeah. So 2020 took on many different um, things for me. I feel like mostly it was a very kind of introspective process of me really being aware of my voice as a Black female scholar. Because um, before it was, I'm grooming myself to be a scholar right? I'm grooming myself to do this, you know, to do scholarly work and um, to, to put my work out there in excellence. But then it shifted to this, this 
hyper awareness that I am a black female scholar in this space. And now I am moving towards a platform where I have, I have access to help others get lifted and recognized in this field. And how am I gonna use this, right? Like how am I going to now use my degree, my research to help elevate and lift up others? So it really was introspective because it's it's you know this hyper awareness from the society, from institutionals, from, from institutions and from everybody that, oh, oh, people are mistreating black people. And it's like, this has been going on for years, right? So now we have this hyper awareness around us and everybody's like, we gotta do something about it. And so this really helped shape a lot of my narratives when I when I conduct research, I do a lot of um, semi-structured interviews with students of color and just asking them about their experiences. And I take that very seriously when I interview these students to kind of pull on what are, what are your experiences? And then I have that responsibility of disseminating that in a way that, that illuminates them in a way that um, can, can move this field forward and, and allow them to have that voice, right? And so many years prior, people weren't pushing the voices of students of color, of giving them that, that place to, to say something and place to be recognized um, for their contributions and for their experiences. And so my work is important in this sense that it's giving these these students that are that are marginalized the space to speak and the space to say this is what I've experienced and this is how it shaped my academic experience and because you know we we are in higher education we're, we're in a place where we're teaching students and we're um, engaging them in in critical thinking we are doing this to people we're teaching people not content you know we can talk to ourselves about content but we're teaching people and so you have to understand who those people are and where they're coming from to be able to effectively teach them and so this 2020 has has allowed me to really kind of see that from a different perspective because it's it's like I said it's this hyper awareness now like I've, like I've been black my whole life but now you have this platform of you know what are you going to do with it like what are you going to do about it so yeah wow um, that was I love your thing like we're teaching people not content that's how do we not like that should be like when the first semester of teaching teachers right yeah. So turning to the faculty member who teaches teachers, Stephanie. Um. So I was just jotting notes because I was thinking of so much with this. I mean, it's such a loaded question of like 2020. Like, it's not even a question. Like, even just saying 2020. Um, for me, I, I just thinking just like right after um, the murder of George Floyd, I, 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 I had to stop. I couldn't work. <laughs> I started serving in the community and getting connected to my colleagues who were connected to the community to find out where can I serve. And so there was, and then, uh, and then I worked on a special issue um, that came out of the causes, uh, education, human development. Um, they call it, we call it the George Floyd issue because folks wrote in about um, their experience, not just their experiences, but like some people woke up and some people have, this is like Angela said, this is a life. And so, um, and so I co-edited that with um, three other women of color from our college. And, and so like going through the, all the images that were submitted and the narratives that people shared with us and like it was such a humbling experience, but emotional. Um, it also recentered like, I'm actually uh, joining y'all from Michigan today because it also recentered like I need to go home. I need to be with my family and take care of family. So that's, it recentered myself during this time, myself, but also taking care of my community, but also understanding like, I don't have to be in Minnesota during a pandemic, I can go home. So, um, so I did what I needed to do there. I came home, but then I saw that started had to have to, I was about to teach. So I had to start preparing for the students that were gonna start with me on race and culture during a global uprising. And, um, and I was the co, I was the, the lead instructor. And so I was supporting grad students also teaching this course. And so with that, um, so much of what I think about now, and as I support teachers that I'm teaching now, I have to think about, there's so many, uh, there's a Facebook group teaching on days after that's um, 
organized by a professor at Michigan State, Alyssa Dunn, because there's so many teaching on days after now and, and supporting cross content. So even science, so science teachers I work with now, even um, in light of, of the murders of eight Asian folks yesterday, like I sent my, my class a message this morning and said, hey, some of your students need space today. And so, so 2020, but on to 2021, it's, it's still this, like, I need to remind them because like treat your kids as humans. They might not hear you today. You need to create space for them so that they can be in space with you and they know that you hear them. And those are the critical moments so often our teacher educators miss or our teachers miss because we feel, so often we feel like someone mentioned this earlier, we have to go on as usual and go on as, as normal. Nothing about this is normal. If I know what I'm experiencing, how are our kids experiencing it? So, so I really have to, so I, I think about self, I think about community, the students I'm in front of, but also the students that they're in front of. And so taking care of those different spaces from day to day is like what I see my responsibility as. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of what you brought up, right, are these are they brought to the forefront, especially this past year, are systemic injustices, again, especially, not especially, but even embedded within STEM. And these are not new. So there's a question from one of the audience members, Murray. She asks, how do you maintain hope when fighting systemic injustices that take generations to address? I'll start. Um, hope is such a tricky word because it's like you you know you have to have it to keep going, <laughs> but you don't want it to be false, right? You don't want it to be something that's embedded in something that's 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 not you know realistic. But I feel like um, I try to to develop an expertise that will help in this area to to push my work forward to talk to people to listen to other giants that have done this work before me to you know go to meetings to to engage in these conversations so i can learn as much as i possibly can so when it comes for me to try to recommend something or say something then it'll be it'll be laced with um, information it'll be laced with um, knowledge and understanding and not not just you know rhetoric of my my personal experience and so I think the hope is in that you know there are other people that are engaged in this type of work that have been doing this and that um, that will continue to do it after me and so at this moment in time I am you know doing my part and trying to do it very well and hoping that that will leave an indelible mark um, in this in this type of in this field, right? And so that's that's what gives me hope. It's just <laughs> talking to others and moving forward. I mean, hearing that gives me a little hope, so I'm excited. <laughs> I try to see the opportunities. Like, there's so much that can be done. Like I said, I, I remember um, when I was collecting dissertation data, there was someone at the state level where I did my, my collected my data and the person said, uh, like, because we weren't doing science education at the elementary level, she's like, try something. Like we can, we, there's so much room of growth. Um, but what gives me hope is also like the kids that I work with, like in, in my class, I try to bring in like these moments of joy as well. Cause I, I, we can't disentangle like blackness is joy. Like I can't, I can't, to me, that is a part of my identity and uh, my community. Uh, like there was one time where I, I played a, a clip of a podcast of this um, a father going into um, uh, Afrocentric school. And he was talking about meeting the principal who was like his auntie and seeing all the black figures on the walls. And you could hear the joy in his voice. And like the students were struck by that, like just to hear this joy of going into a school, because there's so much potential of what we can do in, with our youth. Um, but also what gives me hope is that I see shifts in our students. Like, and, and that's, that's huge to me because I feel like the, the work that I do sometimes is heart work. If I can shift your heart, 
then, then you're going to be open to seeing your kids in a different way. And so like, if, if I can leave an impression on your heart to embrace our kids in a different way, then I know things are going to be a little better, at least a little better and it'll keep getting better. It's all about moving that needle just a little bit, right? So. Yeah. I've just been thinking of, so one of the things that I have been asked so many times, especially if, if I'm doing culturally responsive teaching where we're incorporating sociopolitical examples or environmental justice examples um, from an indigenous perspective, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, how, how do you stay positive and hopeful when there's so many um, examples of environmental racism against indigenous communities, for example? Um, and I used to talk about, okay, you know, absolutely that's something that we have to be aware of, um, but let's, you know, in addition to profiling the things that are happening so people are aware of what's happening, let's look at the areas of indigenous resilience and reclamation as well. And so that was something that I had talked about for a long time because there's so much and there's so many indigenous communities that are reclaiming, you know, not only our language and our culture and our land, but our identities as well. Um, but over the last year, you know, I, that conversation has shifted to, I don't think resilience is a strong enough term. I think a lot of people, a lot of indigenous people are turning to talking about us as relentless, we're relentless people. And, um, and so for me, what gives me hope is, you know, we just nominated or we just, we just have the first female, Native American female Department of the Interior an organization that has historically weaponized everything against native communities in the United States. Um, so for me, that's incredibly hopeful that we are moving forward with, you know, relentless native women <laughs> who are gonna make positive changes that will have an impact on science education, absolutely. Um, similar, I mean, we, our Lieutenant Governor is an indigenous woman from White Earth, so, or a White Earth indigenous woman. So, you know, I, I, I like to position it in that kind of a way, not just resilience and reclamation, but where are we as indigenous people relentless and, you know, how can we foresee those things having impacts on K-12 education, science education, undergraduate education, and just indigenous communities in a broader sense. I I like that word. I'm definitely writing that down now. That's great. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> Someone else on native Twitter. <laughs> so you to whoever find. posted yes. that. I appreciate yep. that. <laughs> yep. uh, but you, okay, so you brought up, I, I have the next question, right? For We have about 10, 12 minutes left. Um, I want to get through a couple more of these questions. Um, so you brought up science education, right? And so we have a question from someone, uh, Brock, uh, on the audience. Uh, as a white man, I am wondering how I can create a classroom where students feel comfortable enough to call me out when I'm speaking from a place of ignorance so that it is in a way where students know I am being genuine and not doing it to save face. Um, and I think like direct, if you have any direct advice or any thoughts. Um, yeah. um, I think that that goes back to a similar thing that we talked about earlier in getting to know your students. And so it's not a one way thing of you getting to know them, they're getting to know you as well as an instructor. And so you can place yourself in, in um, areas where you tell them about yourself, you tell them back your, your background as you're getting to know them as well. And so they, they, you begin to humanize the dialogue between you two. It's not just scientific content to you and, and back and forth. You, you treat them as humans and you treat them, their conversations as, you know, getting to know about who they are and where they come from. And so, like I said, likewise, you, you do the same to them and slowly it'll, it presents more of an approachable personality to your students, especially if you're in a large lecture um, classroom. I tend to teach in large lecture, 100 plus classrooms. And so when you can say, you know, this is who I am and get to know me a little bit uh, more and some of my interests, and then you can turn that around to when you talk to students, even on one-on-one -on -one in your office or when you're engaging in different projects, then they start to see you as a human. They start to see you as approachable. And so not everybody's gonna come up and talk to you, but there may be one or two students that will come up and then they'll tell the others <laughs> that, oh, you know, Mr. Brock is approachable and like he can, you know, he can do this or whatever. So it's it's something that that takes time, but but you have to kind of play that that give and take um, that game. That's fantastic advice. Um. Um, I would just add that um, establishing norms. It depends on like 
like Angela pointed to, like the size of the class, but establishing norms are so important. If your students don't know that you want to, you're able and willing to have that conversation, how will they know? Because there is a power dynamic. And so um, I typically start classes with, uh, we co-develop norms for the, for the space. And when I talk about we're going to have challenging conversations or or sometimes I'm not going to get it right and, and I want you to come to me. Um, I'm explicit about the fact, you know, we are racially different. I'm racially different than the majority of students. I've only had a, a couple, one African American student. Um, and so I, I'm very explicit and I'm upfront about that. And I, and, and because what is, what is uh, the, the common approach is uh, if, if we're culturally different, you don't necessarily see yourself in communication with me so you go over my head or you go to somebody who's white that looks like or who's socially and culturally the same as you and so I try to cut that nip that in the butt right at the beginning where it's like you're going to come to me because what happened and I also try to because they're aspiring teachers or uh, my PhD students aspiring sometimes professors um, I parallel like my classes with how I want them to engage. Like I want them to be, be, uh, view themselves as teachers or professors. So I pose questions in that way. And so how are we even like posing our questions so that they, you're already, you're entering the conversation knowing that they have knowledge and that they are researchers or they are scientists. So as we, so thinking about how we engage students. So um, are, how are we, um, drawing on, and, and Hillary gave a great example, a beautiful example earlier about how are we uh, drawing from students' funds of knowledge, what researchers call funds of knowledge, so like their assets, what are they bringing to the table that you're drawing on, and that they're, you are not always the, the classroom expert. So we have to relinquish some of that power, and that's where it becomes challenging too, because teacher, so often teachers don't don't necessarily want to hear what te students have to say because they don't know what to say in response. And so if we're afraid of the dialogue, then we will close off conversations or we'll disrupt those opportunities so that students will engage with you and get to know you and they'll understand that they can come to you. Um, and so a lot of it is building that relationship, but you we also need to establish the norms and the they will see us in practice and they, they'll know that they can come to you. Oh, yeah, I like that. I was like, that's reminding me of my days of teaching and like, yeah. So. yeah. One thing that's worked for me um, across all levels of working with different people is periodically, and you can do this if you're in, per hopefully in, in person at some point, <laughs> or you could do it in a, you know, a private kind of chat on Zoom or a Google form or a note card or whatever, is just simply asking students to write down what's working for them in your class. And to, and to give them space to tell you what's not working. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important about that exercise is that you give them also the option to remain anonymous and, and that you show them that you're following through. And for me, that's built a lot of trust you know, with students, whether or not they you know, actually take the time to think about you know, this is working or this isn't working, just the exercise in and of itself um, has opened a lot of channels of communication for other things. With students and with you know faculty and TAs that I work with across different contexts. So you know I think it goes back to what Stephanie and Angela have been saying you know this whole time as well is we need to find the ways to you know give students agency and power in their own learning and in in these spaces. Um, and so yeah, but I really appreciate that question too. I, I, I'm thankful for that. Um, so all of you have mentioned building trust, building community. Um, so there's a, one, one other question from Andrew here. So in regards to community, have any of you come across blockades in establishing and enhancing collaboration um, and interdisciplinary learning? So if so, if you have come across these, how have you gone about actively advocating creation of this community with said rigid mentality? So essentially, um, so whether that's in your departments, whether that's in your classrooms, It all of a sudden. <laughs> this, whoever got this, they got a really hard question in right before at the end. Well, could you say it one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah. So, in regards to establishing community, 
Um, have you come across any blockade in either establishing or enhancing collaboration and interdisciplinary learning? If you've come if you've come across those blockades, how have you gone about advocating for community creation construction? I mean, there are different type of blockades. <laughs> so I guess I think about different levels of blockades. Um, so, so let's see. I'm trying to think like which angle. So in thinking about, uh, well, because I don't want to use too many like department examples. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah. um, you don't have to throw your whole so, department under the bus. It's fine. Well, I'll say that like I think. Uh, so even in, in the, the race and culture class that I teach, um, it is interdisciplinary, but also like I'm a science person teaching in like that cross content course. And so there may, so there have been experiences where there are different um, ideas of like what that course should be, the structure should be, um, what, what I, what I hope I, what I have tried to do is is really um, draw on uh, folks who are in in the department, um, like using research from across our um, within our program. Um, so there are a lot of people who've done great work. So so there are um, I think there are ways to to collaborate with people or even inviting folks uh, to teach in the classes. Um, so I don't know if I'm exactly answering the question. Um, yeah, if anyone else has something to say. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about when you said like different ways that we can think about establishing or enhancing collaboration or community. Um, and I think about in the classroom, um, establishing communities within your classroom, like establishing your, your classroom as a community, right? And getting students to have a kind of that sense of belonging within the classroom. And sometimes students resist against like group work or things like that. And so that's that's where my example is gonna come from because that's, that's my experience. And um, one of my faculty mentors, uh, Dr. Anna Grinneth, she does her work in ambitious science teaching and she did this, um, practice of kind of eliciting explanations and ideas from students um, as they kind of go back and forth with different scientific phenomenon, right? They're, they're building these biological explanations um, from their work, but we do kind of genuine science collection, data collection in a large lecture class. And we do this through kind of grappling with statistics, like um, collecting data and analyzing statistics. And sometimes as we're going through this, students are like, well, this is not a statistics class, or I don't want to work in small groups or, you know, whatever, whatever. And so allowing them to have a space where one, they can collect their own data in class, in a large lecture class, they probably have never done that before. And two, um, they can come up with their own kind of scientific explanations of what's going on. If there's no wrong or right, there's no like, there is how can you justify this explanation? How can you, you know, pull from evidence, pull from statistical evidence? So um, they're they're pulling from multiple, you know, representations of the content. They're not just saying this is the content, this is wrong, this is right. And so kind of, like you said, giving the students that agency allowed them to want to build that sense of community where they can say, oh, I can say this and it doesn't have to, you know, be a scientific answer or, or doesn't have to be in, in certain types of vernacular or whatever, I can give my opinion because we collected the data and we know this, 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 um, these, these numbers, we know how this works. And so I feel like that's a way of kind of combating against that, that rigid mentality that there's one way to do science and students in the classroom are just saying that, oh, just teach me the content and let me memorize it and go home. <laughs> like, no, I want you to think about this. I want you to have some stake in this. I want you to collect the data. I want you to see what the data is saying. And then I want you to respond and then defend your answer to the other, you know, classmates. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I thought about. When you <laughs> I, no, I appreciate that. I was like, I see we're almost to the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to spend, I want to just, just save the last minute or two. Um, so we've had we have a lot more questions so for some of your questions that did not get answered i think all the panelists um their information is online you are welcome to reach out to them however they are all busy panelists teaching doing research so don't expect responses right away either um 
So I'll turn it over to each of you one, again, in about 30 seconds, if you could talk about where your research or what is going next, like forward looking uh, before we end this. So about 30 seconds or a minute each. Um, so let's start in the same order. Let's start with Hillary. Sure. Yeah, so my so I started my work with, you know, thinking about what does culturally responsive science teaching look like in undergraduate spaces, and I started building that work with teaching assistants. Um, teaching assistants at the University of Minnesota have a lot of interaction with our um, students, a lot of interaction with our non-major students, which I think, you know, very critical roles that they play in, um, you know, student learning. So that's where my work started. And now, you know, I'm this trend trajectory is, is extending beyond just um, working with undergraduate teaching assistants, moving into um, working with graduate teaching assistants and also um, expanding the work that we're doing with faculty in this space. And so I'm, I'm looking to continue working and, and collaborating and expanding beyond, um, you know, beyond all of these different groups um, and you know, beyond the University of Minnesota as well. Oh, well, I look forward to some of that work. Thanks. Angela, where's your trajectory of work going? Yeah, so right now I'm currently in the lab of uh, Dr. Jeremiah Henning and working on um, looking at students, both hidden and visible identi student identities and their experiences in STEM and seeing how that impacts their retention in, in, in that particular major. And so broadly from there, I'm, I'm still targeting um, students holding multiple marginalized identities and seeing how I can enhance their academic success in that area. Oh, that's awesome. Well, shout out to Dr. Henning. He used to be a postdoc at University of Minnesota. So <laughs> well, yeah, you're part of this family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephanie, where's your work going? I'm actually even thinking a lot about what, what Hillary mentioned about retention of, and we, we know in the Twin Cities, it's really challenging to retain folks of color in STEM. And so I've really been thinking a lot about how do we support the, the building, creating a network across, across the pipeline so that different levels are connected because we often hear about these isolated spaces, but not in connection so that we can, because we are communal people, folks of color are typically communal people. How do we support that community so people can also feel like the Twin Cities is home? Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think I've heard of various programs that get it connected. That sounds amazing. Um, so I, I'll just take one moment to thank each of you. Thank you for sharing your expertise um, today with us. Um, I, the work you're doing is amazing. I, I cannot thank you enough for all the, everything you shared. Uh, the conversation was clearly a lot. There are a lot more questions. I'll turn it over to Dean Forbes her uh, one last time, and then we'll go from there. Well, I would just like to um... Ditto that, Mo, and thank you for hosting and thank all of our panelists for an excellent discussion. That was really, really fascinating and informative. And I know there are tons of questions that we weren't able to answer, but um, hopefully a lot of them did get answered. And I would like to thank all of our participants. At one point, I think we had up to 104 people in the audience. So uh, very good. So. Thanks everybody for joining us and look forward to the next time. Thank you everyone. Have a good Thank evening. You.